Thank you, Chairman. It's a pleasure to be here. I come from Glasgow, which, as you may know, is one of the black spots in Europe for arterial thrombosis, coronary heart disease, and stroke. And that's really why I became interested in it as a, as a physician. I have no disclosures. As you probably know, arterial thrombosis is, is a major problem. We've been hearing about venous thrombosis, but arterial thrombosis is about 10 times more likely to kill you compared to venous thrombosis. And of us sitting here in this room, at least 50% of us will die of uh, arterial thrombosis, usually coronary heart disease or stroke. So we should all be quite interested in uh, what, it comes about, uh, what are the processes through uh, which thrombosis occurs, and more importantly, what can we try and do to uh, prevent it. So coronary heart disease, um, acute coronary heart disease, as you all know, presents with crushing central chest pain. You go to a hospital coronary care unit. Uh, there may be no damage to the heart. That's unstable angina. Alternatively, you may get damage to the heart, which is more serious, myocardial infarction, where part of the myocardium uh, dies of ischemic damage. Uh, most strokes are thrombotic in origin. 15% of strokes, however, are hemorrhagic rather than uh, thrombotic. And peripheral arterial disease, acute peripheral arterial disease, critical limb ischemia, where the limb becomes white and uh, painful, that is almost always uh, an arterial uh, thromboembolic uh, event. Now, most of these events are occurring upon an atherosclerotic plaque, which fissures or ruptures. Well, we don't understand why that happens. Usually it's spontaneous rather than precipitated by some acute environmental uh, stress. And atherosclerotic plaques are present in everybody sitting in this room. From uh, childhood, from teenage years onwards, we're all developing uh, arterial plaques. And in some patients, there may be a previous history of uh, uh, chronic uh, ischemia, angina, transient cerebral ischemic attacks or claudication before the acute uh, thrombotic uh, event. And this cartoon illustrates what's happening to us uh, throughout life. So if we start at birth, we have normal uh, arteries, nice and clean. And then, although a clinically silent process, uh, as we age, we develop fatty streaks in our teenage years. Uh, most of us in this room have developed to the stage of being a little bit fibrotic. And then um, older people, like me, are becoming a bit uh, atherosclerotic. That means that the lumen of the artery is being occluded by 50% or, uh, or more. And at that stage, we may start getting uh, stable angina, reversible acute myocardial ischemia when we walk or get excited, TIAs, or when we walk about, we might get uh, uh, claudication. Now, these things are a nuisance. They're disabling, but they're not fatal. And the critical thing about plaque rupture and arterial thrombosis on the right-hand side of the slide is that this is the pathology that precipitates serious cardiovascular uh, events. So we have a, a ruptured plaque, we get a platelet fibrin thrombus forming upon it. Now that may still be clinically silent, and these small thrombi may be incorporated into the atherosclerotic plaque and actually contribute to the process of uh, uh, atherosclerosis. But on the other hand, the larger thrombi may precipitate uh, acute coronary syndromes such as myocardial infarction, ischemic strokes, critical leg ischemia, and of course uh, any of these uh, acute serious events uh, can be fatal. I'd like to emphasize that arterial thrombosis is a dynamic process. We're probably forming small arterial thrombi uh, throughout middle age, and we're just not, uh, we're just not aware of it. The idea that uh, thrombosis could contribute to ather atherosclerosis goes back to the uh, German pathologist uh, Rokotensky, and it was revised by the Scottish pathologist Duguid in Aberdeen in the 1940s, who did careful studies showing that, uh, indeed, you can find small thrombi, at least in dead Scottish people, that look as if they're progressing uh, atheromatous um, progression. Larger thrombi cause clinical symptoms, and especially very occlusive. And the important thing, as you'll hear about after coffee, is that this is a reversible process. Some of these thrombi reverse spontaneously, but in others, treatments such as thrombolysis uh, can greatly improve the clinical outcome.
So if we look now at a cross-section of an artery, for example, a coronary artery, we've got lipid-rich plaque, there is fissuring or rupturing, that may heal up and uh, still be asymptomatic, or it may progress if the patient is in a prothrombotic state, you get a mural thrombus growing out from the arterial wall. So this, for example, may cause uh, unstable angina with uh, prolonged severe pain. If you then go to hospital, uh, tests such as electrocardiography or troponin levels will confirm uh, if you have progressed to an occlusive thrombus and that is causing death of myocardium, myocardial infarction. But this is a reversible process. So if you get admitted to a coronary care unit and if you get rapidly put onto antiplatelet agents such as aspirin and clopidogrel, plus uh, anticoagulants uh, such as low molecular weight heparin, the idea is you're trying to stop progression of the thrombus uh, and progress things back to your uh, pre-thrombotic uh, state. Or if you have a fully occlusive uh, thrombus, uh, so-called ST elevation myocardial infarction from the ECG appearances, then either thrombolysis or more recently percutaneous uh, cardiac uh, intervention will uh, uh, improve the prognosis. And you'll hear all about that from the subsequent speakers. This is what uh, arterial uh, thrombi look like. So here we've got an atheromatous artery. This is a coronary artery visualized during uh, acute myocardial infarction, uh, putting a, a camera up the catheter. Here you can see a ruptured uh, plaque. Initially, there's hemorrhage into the plaque. And then uh, platelets and fibrin uh, form the uh, occlusive uh, thrombus there. McFarlane, who along with Ratnoff described in the 1960s the coagulation uh, cascade, coined the phrase which I quite like, but thrombosis is hemostasis in the wrong place. I mean, platelets and fibrin are just doing their job. The problem is they think it's a skin wound, which it's appropriate to seal, whereas the ruptured arterial plaque, that big hemostatic plug is a thrombus and is doing you more harm than good. So we know that antiplatelet and anticoagulant drugs are effective not only in treatment, but also in prevention, and I'll come back to that. And thrombolytic drugs and percutaneous or surgical removal uh, are effective treatments. I want to just briefly talk about uh, thrombi arising in the heart and embolizing to the limbs and brain, because this is the cause of about 25% of thrombotic strokes and about a similar proportion of critical limb ischemia. The usual cause nowadays is atrial fibrillation. This is a common arrhythmia prevalent in about 5% of the older uh, population. And with an aging population, this arrhythmia is becoming important. And it not only reduces cardiac function, more important, the paralysis of uh, atrial function uh, encourages uh, thrombi. You can also get thrombi occurring on diseased heart valves, congenital valve disease, rheumatic heart disease, uh, endocarditis in, for example, intravenous drug users. And if you repair uh, heart valve disease by putting in a prosthetic valve, uh, then this can also be a, a source of thromboembolism. You've seen uh, some ultrasound pictures from Professor Agnelli, and the picture I'm going to show you next just shows the uh, chambers of the heart, the right, and, uh, right atrium, right ventricle, and you will see a, a prosthetic uh, mitral valve, and then probably due to a dysfunction of this valve behind it in the left atrium, is a thrombus. Uh, so this is what the cardiologist uh, would, uh, would see. This is the prosthetic mitral valve. And here in the left atrium, you can see this shadow, and that's a thrombus. And the problem is that that can embolize into a left ventricle, go into the arterial circulation, and impact in a, the brain. As, uh, for example, shown in this uh, CT scan of a, a brain. And here you have a large area of cerebral infarction. And the problem about thromboembolic stroke arising from the heart is that these thrombi are large, they uh, rapidly damage uh, the brain, uh, and we published uh, in The Lancet in 1983 that patients uh, who have atrial fibrillation and then a stroke uh, are much more likely to die or become disabled uh, from that stroke, and many other studies have confirmed that. So it's a particularly severe type of stroke, and this emphasizes the importance of what Professor Agnelli will talk to you about, which is the management of atrial fibrillation. It's important to diagnose it and treat it with uh, uh, antithrombotic drugs to prevent this very uh, severe kind of stroke.
So I'm now going to turn in the rest of my talk from pathogenesis to epidemiology. As you know, that's the study of disease in populations. You heard about it from Professor Rosendahl yesterday. And just as with uh, the epidemic of uh, venous thrombosis in the last uh, 60 years, there's been an epidemic of arterial thrombosis. So in the second half of last century, coronary heart disease and stroke became an epidemic and they replaced in developing, uh, developed countries infections as the major cause of death and disability. This global epidemic continues in developing countries as they become more developed. Now, trying to relate this to pathogenesis, what happened? What's happened over the last 60 years? Do we have more atherosclerosis, or are we becoming more thrombotic? And the next two slides, which I've taken from these textbooks, I, I would like to convince you that we're becoming more thrombotic rather than more atherosclerotic. Now, this first slide comes from a review by uh, Professor Mead in London, and he has combined uh, two types of uh, data from the United Kingdom. So this line here, A, this shows the increasing epidemic of fatal coronary heart disease in the United Kingdom from a very low rate in uh, 1910, the first part of the 20th century, and then exponentially increasing so that by 1970 there had been this uh, enormous increase in fatal coronary heart disease, usually myocardial infarction. Now, and, and that was seen across, uh, across the world in uh, developed countries. Now, is this due to more coronary atherosclerosis? Well, interestingly, in the uh, London Hospital, which is a hospital in the east end of London, all the poor people lived there, and if you died in the London Hospital, you routinely had an autopsy. And one of the pathologists there, for a five-year period, about 1910, systematically dissected the coronary arteries of these men and found that 30% of men aged 50 to 69 years had extensive advanced uh, coronary uh, atheroma. Interestingly, in the late 1940s, when this epidemic of increased coronary heart disease was well underway, this was repeated. And you can see that there has not been any increase in the prevalence of advanced coronary uh, atherothrombosis. If anything, it had gone down from 30% to 20%. Now, the timing may be problematic because this was at the end of World War II. And, of course, across Europe, everybody was semi-starved. So it may have been there is actually some regression of atherosclerosis. But the point I'm trying to make is that there was not an increase in uh, coronary atherosclerosis. So, is this epidemic because we're more thrombotic rather than more uh, atherosclerotic? And if you look at venous thrombosis, which you heard about yesterday from Professor Rosendahl, um, it has shown the same uh, exponential increase. This is uh, UK data, uh, deaths from pulmonary embolism, and uh, between uh, 1940 and 1970, showing exactly the same uh, uh, epidemic. So I would suggest to you that uh, in the last half of the 20th century, we became more thrombotic, and that's manifest both in our veins and in our arteries. Now, epidemiological studies have confirmed the pathology of arterial thrombosis. So atherothrombosis is responsible for most coronary heart disease, 75% of ischemic strokes and peripheral arterial disease, cardiac thromboembolism, an important cause, 25% of ischemic stroke and peripheral arterial disease. And uh, over time, atrial fibrillation is becoming the commonest underlying pathology of cardiac thromboembolism, and it's replacing valve disease as rheumatic heart disease uh, becomes less common. Now, what are the causes of atherothrombosis? Epidemiologists have been studying the predictors of risk in populations, and the best-known example is the Framingham study. This is a small town just outside Boston in the northeastern United States. Um, and in particular, they put together the different risk factors for predicting arterial thrombotic events into scores. And the Framingham scores for coronary heart disease and stroke are, are well-known and used throughout the world. Interestingly, uh, the Framingham study showed that the risk predictors for coronary heart disease are also very similar to the risk predictors of stroke and peripheral arterial disease. So in other words, atherothrombosis is a systemic disease, and indeed if you have um, atherothrombosis at one site, then all clinicians know that 
makes you more likely to have another atherothrombotic event at another site in the body. It's a systemic uh, uh, disease. Now, what are the risk predictors? Let's start with two that we can do nothing about, and that's age and sex. There's an exponential increase with age in coronary heart disease, stroke, and peripheral arterial disease, exactly as you saw yesterday from Professor Rosendahl for venous thrombosis. And as in the case of venous thrombosis, it may not be age that itself is causal. It's just that with time we get the cumulative effects of the causal risk factors, which I'll come to in a minute, uh, which are progressing atherosclerosis, and also we're becoming more uh, thrombotic. If, for example, you look at uh, markers in the circulation of uh, fibrin turnover, such as fibrin D-dimer, it's interesting that um, between 60 and 80 years, um, that doubles. So in the last 20 years of our lifespan, which is the time period when most of us get a thrombotic event, we are becoming more uh, thrombotic. Nothing we can do about it. We can't get any younger. Males have, uh, get coronary heart disease and also peripheral arterial disease sooner than women at an earlier age in life. And the reasons we still don't really understand, there are several possibilities. Um, from puberty, uh, with the surge in testosterone, males develop a higher hematocrit, so they have a higher blood viscosity, they may have different platelet behavior in, in whole blood, but we've done meta-analysis of the association of hematocrit as a predictor of coronary heart disease and stroke. And these associations are not quantitatively uh, sufficient to explain why males have higher events. Likewise, uh, male hormones result in men having lower levels of high-density lipoprotein uh, cholesterol, which is the, uh, the good cholesterol. That lipoprotein is almost certainly involved in uh, transfer of lipids out of the arterial wall, it's, it's protective. But again, the Emerging Risk Factors Collaboration has analyzed all the prospective studies of HDL and coronary heart disease, and again, these appear quantitatively insufficient to explain the, the gender difference. So does it all come down to hormones? And in particular, um, are women protected by uh, female uh, hormones? This was thought to be the case maybe 15 years ago. But as you know, large randomized trials of hormone replacement uh, therapy uh, have not shown any benefit in coronary heart disease. And indeed, these drugs, at least when taken by mouth, are prothrombotic and give an excess of stroke, including fatal stroke, and uh, uh, a definite increase in risk of deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. So we're a bit skeptical as to whether female hormones, although they may have favorable effects on the vessel wall and lipid metabolism, uh, are, are protective. I think the important thing about women having less coronary heart disease is not to get that out of proportion because not only half of men but half of women will die of coronary heart disease and other types of arterial thrombosis. And it's very easy for a woman to lose her protection. For example, she may take up smoking and that gives her the coronary heart disease risk of a male non-smoker just like that. And I'll show you the data on that in a minute. So let's turn to the causal and reversible risk predictors, which, because they're causal, we can now call risk factors and not just risk predictors. And these are the big three. Uh, tobacco smoking, arterial blood pressure, and cholesterol. And these explain about 90% of differences between individuals living in the same country all around the world. So these are the three causal risk factors. Tobacco smoking, we know it's not just active smoking, but in recent years, convincing evidence that passive smoking. So if you're a child, don't have smoking parents. Uh, if, if you live with a, a partner, then encourage him or her not to smoke. We know that passive smoking, although less strong, is definitely a, a causal risk factor. And that's been demonstrated, for example, by the smoking bans in several countries around the world, including most European countries, which show a rapid decrease in the risk of coronary heart disease uh, within months, particularly in exposed people like um, barmen. Now, it's impossible to show causality of smoking by randomized trials. You can't randomize people to start smoking or not start smoking. And there are very few randomized trials of trying of randomizing people to intensive smoking reduction versus carry on smoking. And the results are inconclusive. But the observational studies are extremely convincing. It's a dose-dependent relationship. 
people who stop smoking, the risk uh, uh, decreases, and uh, it's all, it all makes sense. So there are many good reasons not to take up smoking or to stop smoking, not only cardiovascular disease, but also many cancers. Now, blood pressure has a particular impact on stroke, but it's also a major risk factor for coronary heart disease and peripheral arterial disease. And here we have meta-analyses of very large amounts of data from randomized controlled trials, the blood pressure trial is collaboration, and there is no doubt that the more you lower blood pressure, the more you reduce the risk of all arterial thrombotic events. And likewise, in recent years, trials of lipid-reducing uh, drugs, particularly statins, which lower low-density lipoprotein cholesterol and hence total cholesterol, these show uh, predictable dose-dependent reductions in the risk of arterial events, coronary heart disease, stroke, peripheral arterial disease, uh, which are related to the uh, degree of cholesterol reduction. And as in the case of blood pressure, these mimic exactly the epidemiological uh, relationships. So, why do we think that smoking blood pressure and cholesterol are the three main causes of arterial thrombosis? There was doubt about this perhaps uh, 10, 20 years ago, because in epidemiological studies, if you just measure these variables once and follow them up, like Framingham did, then if you do the statistical analysis, you only explain, in inverted commas, about 50% of individual differences in risk of, of coronary heart disease. But the problem is that if you take only one measurement of cholesterol or blood pressure or a smoking habit, uh, that's a very imprecise estimate of a person's mean level across their lifespan. So if you do what uh, John Emerson did in the British Regional Heart Study, a large study across 24 British towns where these risk factors were measured every five years over a 20-year period, four times, and then do the calculation, you can explain 90% of the inter-individual risk. And in a sense, this has concentrated our mind on these risk factors because when we thought that they only explained about 50% of risk, we all went actively looking for new risk factors. But in fact, we don't have to because from these simple variables, which doctors can assess routinely, as I'll show you in a minute, we can predict pretty accurately uh, the risk of uh, disease. Now, how do these risk factors promote disease? Are they atherogenic? Well, yes, they are. If you do studies of young people who die, for example, from car accidents, and you dissect the arteries and look at their pre-measured uh, characteristics, such as smoking, blood pressure, and cholesterol, there's no doubt that all these factors are associated with the extent of atherosclerosis from an early age, such as in the, the P-Day studies. But also, we think increasingly from epidemiological studies that they're also uh, thrombogenic. As you heard yesterday from Professor Rosendahl, smoking is definitely a reversible dose-dependent risk factor for venous thrombosis. That's just been confirmed, not only the mega study in the Netherlands that you heard about, but a study in the British Medical Journal a few months ago by Hippersley Cox using a very large UK-wide general practice database. Uh, smoking is, is very uh, obviously a risk factor for venous thrombosis. It's just that epidemiologists have not been very good at studying venous thrombosis, but the data now emerging shows that it's there. Um, we're not so sure about blood pressure and cholesterol and venous thrombosis, but we do know that obesity, which is strongly linked to blood pressure and cholesterol, is very definitely a risk factor uh, for venous thrombosis. So what are the implications for prevention? Well, everybody in this room, as you know, has probably been counseled from an early age about these things are bad for you. Live a healthy lifestyle. So the advice we now give to our children is don't smoke, exercise, and don't become fat. And this is very important because we have an emerging epidemic globally of obesity, and it starts in childhood. And the, the greater your weight in childhood, the less exercise you do in childhood, the unhealthy diet in childhood, these are all clearly having repercussions uh, in, in adult life. So we try and reduce the risk at the population level by advising everybody to live a healthy lifestyle. And at the same time, we try and, as a complementary approach, identify high-risk individuals in whom we start uh, concentrating preventive drug therapy. And many countries uh, in Europe now have risk assessments starting in men and women from about 40 years and repeated every five years or so, where you measure these risk factors and try and pick out the men and women at, at highest risk 
to add to the lifestyle advice and intensify it, uh, the consideration for drug treatment. So this is a kind of uh, campaign that we try and encourage people to do. The two best things to do if you don't want arterial thrombosis are uh, stop smoking and keep walking. Simple message. And then we can use risk prediction charts. So we look at our patient's age, sex, do they smoke or not. We measure their systolic blood pressure because the risk increases uh, continuously with blood pressure. We look at their lipids, and most people now use total cholesterol and HDL cholesterol, which are simple to measure. You don't need a fasting blood sample. And the ratio of these, total to LDL, is strongly associated with risk as a continuous variable. And what most people now do is they divide middle-aged people into those at low risk, less than 10% risk of uh, coronary heart disease or stroke over 10 years, moderate risk, 10 to 20%, and high risk, greater than 20%. It's very important that we don't apply this inappropriately to subgroups such as people with diabetes who are at high risk uh, for additional reasons. So we're talking only about using these risk prediction charts in healthy people, no coronary heart disease, no evidence of uh, any type of arterial disease, uh, and not diabetic. And this is a kind of charts which, for example, appear in the British National Formulary used by family doctors in the United Kingdom. So... We now have health checks from 40 years uh, across the UK. Uh, so the doctor or the um, uh, practice nurse identifies man, woman, age under 50, 50 to 59, 60 or over, smoker, non-smoker, and then you start looking at the results of blood pressure and lipid measurements. So let's just take one segment of this uh, chart here. And here we are. So we're looking at men without diabetes aged under 50 years, smokers and non-smokers. What you see here is it's like a traffic-like system. So green, okay, 10-year risk less than 10%. Uh, amber, caution, 10 to 20% of the next 10 years. Red, danger zone, greater than 20% risk. So it, it's nice and simple. And the doctor or the nurse can actually sit down with the patient and talk them through the risk factors and say, well, now let's see where you are. So um, you can see that smokers are more likely to be in the, the red zone, as you would expect, compared to non-smokers. And then if you look at the x-axis, this is the ratio of total to HDL cholesterol. And you can see that with uh, an increase in this ratio, you go from green to amber or to red if you're a smoker. And then this is systolic blood pressure here. Again, the risk goes up. And the point of these charts is I think they illustrate quite nicely that smoking, blood pressure, and cholesterol are additive or synergistic. It's the combination of these risk factors that increases the risk. And this is why it's important to look particularly at people with very high cholesterols, very high blood pressures, very high smoking. For most people, we're a mixture of the moderate risk, but then we can refine our risk and see whether we need uh, specific drug treatments. So what about other risk factors? Um, family history of premature cardiovascular disease, premature stroke, premature coronary heart disease, so before age uh, um, 50 in a man, before age 60 in a woman. That gives you additional risk prediction. And in fact, some recent risk scores, such as the ASSIGN score in Scotland or the Reynolds uh, score in the United States, now incorporate family history, because that definitely adds to risk. Almost certainly it's genetic factors, of which the most well-known is familial hyperlipoproteinemia, one in 200 people, and many countries are now advocating a case uh, finding, so all patients with premature myocardial infarction are screened for this, and then their family members are screened to, to pick it up and treat it with statins or whatever in childhood. It's probably also uh, thrombotic genes like thrombophilias, although the impact of these is small. So if you take, for example, factor V Leiden and the prothrombin mutation, both associated with up to a five-fold uh, relative increase in risk of venous thrombosis, they're there, but they're very small. So you're talking about relative risks of 1.2, 1.4. Who cares? Don't measure it. So we're not very good at identifying any specific uh, genes which predispose to, uh, to venous thrombosis. Obesity, diabetes, psychosocial factors, biomarkers. Let's very briefly then look at these. Now, this is obesity. This is what we call the hazardous waste syndrome because we know that it's not just uh, obesity as measured by, for example, the 
uh, weight to height ratio, but it's the distribution of obesity. It's central obesity or male pattern obesity as shown here by this typical Scottish beer drinking man. Um, so a hazardous substance is stored. It's the excess fat packed around your middle, fat that increases your risk of heart disease and other serious illnesses such as diabetes. Good reason to start a waste disposal program today. And this, as you know, is the epidemic fueled by companies I will not name, uh, fizzy drinks, burgers, junk food, and the lack of exercise. We sit in cars and traffic jams. We watch television all day. And we're just becoming fat people. So it's a global epidemic. It's happening increasingly in developing countries. And once you develop obesity, your blood pressure goes up, your blood lipids become adverse, and you become more thrombogenic. If you look at epidemiological studies of coagulation activation, for example, they go up uh, with weight. So you advise everybody to lose weight. But do you add it to risk prediction? Interestingly, it doesn't really add that much. If you look at data from the Emerging Risk Factors Collaboration published this year, um, you don't get that much uh, incremental prediction over blood pressure and cholesterol. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't measure obesity. Uh, it's important to identify people who are above ideal weight, get them to reduce it. It's good for just about all health problems, from arthritis to diabetes to cardiovascular disease to, to cancer. You know, lose that weight. But interestingly, its effect on arterial thrombosis seems to be largely mediated through uh, the effect of obesity in increasing blood pressure and in, in changing body, uh, body lipids. Now, the other thing that obesity is doing is to drive a global epidemic of type 2 diabetes. So that's maturity onset uh, diabetes as distinct from type 1, which occurs due to pancreatic destruction in, in younger people. Now, this is a case where diabetes definitely adds prediction of coronary heart disease, stroke, and interestingly, particularly peripheral arterial disease, it's more extensive, it goes further than the leg. And it's an additional predictor of everything bad, a death from any cause. Uh, so diabetics get more cardiovascular disease, uh, they get more cancers, they get more infections, as shown in the recent publication from the Emerging Risk Factors Collaborations. And diabetes is bad for everything. And hence, it's very important when you screen for cardiovascular risk, you screen for diabetes. You pick it up and you treat it regardless of the other uh, risk factors. It's important to treat the diabetes per se. What about psychosocial factors? Well, just about every bad state of mind increases the risk of arterial thrombosis. Acute mental stress, like acute physical stress, can occasionally trigger a myocardial infarction. Anxious people get more trouble. Depressed people get more trouble. Schizophrenic people get more coronary heart disease. In that case, probably because schizophrenic people tend to be sedentary and have a poor diet and sit there smoking and being miserable. So it's possibly all mediated through the other risk factors. I think the most interesting psychosocial factor is social deprivation. And I'm interested in this because Glasgow is a black spot in Europe for cardiovascular disease because we're a very deprived community. Uh, we have uh, very high numbers of people living in housing estates with unemployment, not only in this generation, but in two or even three generations. People just sit there and, and live a very deprived life. Now, every uh, one of the multiple measures of social deprivation, education, housing, transport, washing machines, whatever, is very accurately captured, in the UK at least, by a postcode. And everybody has a postcode. So what we've done in Scotland is we're the first country to add in a, a postcode score. To identify, that's a very convenient way. Every family doctor has it on the computer database, dial in the postal code, and you can tell how it's not the individual patient, but it's the small postal area that it accurately is a surrogate measure of deprivation. England have started doing this as well. Americans don't use it because apparently they don't have social deprivation in the United States, and I'm very pleased to hear that. So that's a useful addition to the score. Finally, biomarkers. Uh, here, I suppose, we're all interested in biomarkers of hemostasis and thrombosis. And fibrinogen has been now measured in many epidemiological studies, and there's no doubt that the higher the plasma fibrinogen level, the higher the risk of uh, arterial th uh, thrombosis. The problem is that that is probably nothing to do with uh, thrombosis. It's probably because fibrinogen 
like C-reactive protein, white cell count, low albumin level. These are all markers of low-grade systemic inflammation. And the data is nicely summarized in the Emerging uh, Risk Factors Collaboration paper. Now, does that mean that family doctors, as part of routine risk assessment, should not only send off a blood sample for blood lipids, should they be doing fibrinogen or CRP or white cell count or whatever? Uh, the answer is no, because if you then look at the additional value uh, to conventional risk prediction charts, which I've shown you, it's very small. These associations are not strong enough to make an important contribution to individual risk prediction. Some have stressed, particularly in the United States, with CRP, for example, may improve risk stratification if you're in this intermediate zone and may indicate whether you go up or down uh, so you can have more correct assignment of statins. But that's very controversial. And in a paper in a prestigious journal, which I hope will be published shortly, you will see the exact level of incremental value in men and women. You can judge for yourselves, but don't get very excited about the result when you read it. Another type of biomarker, apart from measuring circulating levels of uh, inflammation or thrombosis, is to try and study asymptomatic atherosclerosis. That is probably done most simply by just measuring blood pressure not only in the arm, but in the leg, at the ankle. And the ankle brachial index is a quite a nice measure of asymptomatic lower limb atherosclerosis. And it's been shown in a collaboration published in JAMA two years ago that that, uh, if you have an ABI of less than 0.9, indicating asymptomatic atherosclerosis of the leg, that gives you a relative risk of 4, which again is quite strong, but not sufficient to make any difference to clinical management. For, as an example, we published the aspirin and asymptomatic atherosclerosis study last year in JAMA and randomizing people, asymptomatic people, with no clinical evidence of arterial disease but a low ABI to aspirin doesn't make any difference, doesn't help. So at the moment, there's no good indication for performing these uh, uh, time-consuming and quite expensive tests. For example, if you go to CT for coronary calcium or ultrasound of the carotids for uh, asymptomatic atherosclerosis, these are expensive and they don't, they, they, they're not worth the money. They don't give you much additional information. So finally, what can we do in terms of primary prevention? After coffee, we'll discuss treatment. What can we do to prevent it happening in the first place? And in high-risk individuals, there's a good case if the person cannot stop smoking, for example, for considering short-term anti-smoking drugs, such as nicotine substitution with patches or chewing gum. Blood pressure reducing drugs, uh, most clinical guidelines, and they vary by country, advocate that you give drug treatment for blood pressure at an extreme. For example, even a young person with a systolic blood pressure of 160 in the absence of other risk factors, you want to treat that because uh, it's going to have adverse effects uh, throughout their life. And in middle-aged people, most guidelines suggest that if your risk of cardiovascular disease is greater than 20% over 10 years, then in addition to lifestyle measures, you should be having pharmacological treatment of your, of your blood pressure. And similarly, with uh, cholesterol reduction, uh, statins, for example, extremes. So if you're even a young person with a total cholesterol greater than, than 8 uh, you need screening to check you don't have familial hyperlipoproteinemia, and you need, uh, you need treatment to reduce that cholesterol, even in the absence of other risk factors. In the general middle-aged population, again, if your risk of coronary heart disease or stroke is greater than 20% over 10 years, that's 